and I just had a conversation with God and I just sort of out loud there's nobody around and just out loud I just said you know I really want to die and I just started um, walking down the street which sounds so easy but it was uh, the hardest thing I had ever done in my life it was uh, a Looking back, one of the pivotal times in my life, one of the real turning points in my lifetime so far. And so I had this dream that, um, and I don't know how to, exp I don't really know how to explain it, other than I wasn't seeing a movie, but it was like an impression on my mind that was saying, "You need to get to the hospital now." Um, you're they're not going to let you in to the room they're not going to easily let you into the hospital room you need to be bold and fight to get in the hospital room it's imperative that you get into the hospital room and I say to my dad I'm sorry I was such a bad kid and I felt my dad say that he was sorry and that he loved me. So mom's contention was that her childhood was far worse than mine. Um, so how did you f finally leave? Um, because the babysitter, I mean, and how old was the babysitter anyway? I don't know, she's probably 15, 16, yeah. something like so that. So that was the age group that they all yeah. preyed upon. Yeah. Um, so um, in the second house that I that I was in, you know, there was the taking of the trees and the girl disappeared and, um, you know, having sex with whoever, he, you know, he said to have um, sex with. Um, and then there was a neighbor um, and the, uh, the neighbor had puppies and I really, um, sometimes the puppies would make their way down and I loved getting to see the puppies. And, and um, there came a, I mean, I was fully, I drank the Kool-Aid, you know, like I really believed that this guy was Satan and that um, if I went anywhere or did anything, even if he wasn't there, that he had eyes everywhere and that there was, you know, consequences for not obeying and I, was fully saturated in that in that mm. terror in that belief, uh, particularly after the jail, uh, the going into the police station. Mm. Like, okay, I, I believe you. So I'm outside in the backyard. Uh, Peter's not around. The girl is gone. Um, the house mother's in the house or wherever she's at, and I'm standing in the in the back, um, and the puppies were there, and I just had a conversation with God. And I just sort of out loud, there's nobody around, I just out loud, I just said, you know, I really want to die. Um, this is, uh, and, I, and I'm wondering out loud, if I kill myself, um, is hell real? And will I go to this place called hell if I kill myself? Would God understand why I killed myself? Or would I go to hell? Mm -hmm. um, or um, if I do, I, if I kill myself, is car is like reincarnation and karma real? If I kill myself, am I going to come back um, in a life that is worse than the life that I'm living? And it's permanent. Like you can't undo. You kill yourself, whichever way you go. Like that. That's it. Um, so I don't want to live but I, um, I'm afraid to kill myself. And so I'm saying this sort of out, the puppies are running around and I'm sort of saying this out, out loud. And s at some point, and so I, I, I said to God, I'm like, look, I don't know if you're real. You know, I had the revival um, uh, experience mm -hmm. and, you know, I hope that you're real. I don't know if you are, but if you are real, help me, help me because I, I, I don't know what to do, and I don't want to keep going on the way I am. And, 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 and truly, 
truly, I am tired. You know, I'm um, 17, just about, you know, 17, and I, I've, I'm done. I'm, I'm ready for this life to be over, really ready for this life to be over. What, what made that moment, that finality of that declaration? What made, was it the dogs, the puppies, or was it just no, I, uh, the I, fear? I, I think it was, you know, another person came into my bed while I was sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I didn't know, I, I would go to sleep and I wouldn't know if some guy would be in my bed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was just um, tired. Mm -hmm. I was just really tired. I was malnutritioned. Um, I was just done. And really, truly meant I, I didn't want to live. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was around the time that the house mother um, took me to her dad's house and she told me stories of how wonderful her mom and her mom had MS and her dad was a superhero and her brothers and sisters had wonderful Thanksgiving and her dad makes homemade pies and it just sounded like you know like such an ideal Norman Rockwell kind of beautiful thing and um, and she said it was around Thanksgiving and and she said, do you want to, I think it was after Thanksgiving, it was around the holidays, Christmas, and she said, do you want to go over to my dad's and make pie? And I was like, yes, you know, that would make me so happy. And I went over, and I thought she was going to be with me, but instead she brought me over to her dad's house, and she left, and left me alone with her dad, and her and the dad shows me around the house and the mother is, is passed away and he's there's apples and there's dough and there's pie pans and and I'm thinking we're gonna make apple pie oh, no. and um, and he starts shaking and he's like can I please touch your breasts it's been so long since I've touched bre and he's chasing me around the table and I think it was like I had just like had it with humanity. Mm -hmm. I was just like done. So I said that prayer outside and I don't know if it was a day later or three days later, I don't really remember, but um, at some point I walked out the front yard and where she lived, it was like a country mile before the next house and then a country mile next house, country mile next house. And so in my imagination, I wasn't supposed to be in the front yard, and I thought if I'm in the front yard and Peter comes, I can say this or that or whatever. Um, and I just started um, walking down the street, which sounds so easy, but it was uh, the hardest thing I had ever done in my life because I was brainwashed into thinking worse than death would befall me if I got caught walking down the street and I'm walking down the street. So it is total panic. And the first house I come to on the left, again, it, it's so interesting how God or whatever you want to call, I call it God. I go to this first house, I knock on the door, somebody happens to be home. She goes to open the door. As soon as it's cracked, I push my way in so I'm not seen and get in to her house and I tell her I'm in trouble and I need help and um, it just so happens that she's going to a place called Crossroads for Women mm -hmm. for alcoholism the next day and and why she didn't call the police again why didn't she call the police why didn't she ask for my mom and dad's phone number why didn't you know why 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 that's true I mean why I would call the police. The police would you know, be the first I would thing. call a lawyer. Yeah. I would say, how can I help this person? Oh. I would, you know, call the district attorney. I would call somebody. She called the uh, Crossroads for Women mm. and said, hey, I'm supposed to be there tomorrow um, for my admittance. Um, this girl just, like, stormed in my door. What do I do? And they told her. Why didn't they tell her? Mm. Call the police, call whatever. Instead, they told her, bring her with you. So that night I laid underneath her guest bed because I was so afraid 
And sure enough, I found out later that uh, Peter did go out um, on a rampage looking for me. Somebody was shot, um, not killed, but shot. You know, I mm. was money and his money was gone. So it wasn't the house mother that was supposed to pick you back up? Maybe, right, whatever. I don't phone. know. I don't know. But you just uh, took off. <laughs> right. I just took off. So the next morning, the lady's husband pulled the car sort of catty corner and opened the back door. And I went in the floorboard and I curled up in the floorboard of the car and went to Crossroads. And Crossroads was supposed to be... 30 days and they let me stay 90 days. It's supposed to be for women over 18. I, my birthday is the end of April. So it's like, was I 16? Was I 17? But right around that time. Mm -hmm. um, and they let, uh, you know, I wasn't 18 and they let me stay. And I just um, lied about alcohol. I just said, yeah, I drank. You know, my story mm -hmm. was enough for them to keep me. And, um, and they kept me a long time. And then um, they didn't know what to do with me after that three month period. Again, it's a 30 day program. Mm -hmm. I was there 90 days. Again, right? And so, I, and I had talked to my mom and dad, you know, I, I'm good, I'm, you know, I'm alive, click. Like and now, what was the time period now that's passed that your parents didn't hear from you? Because there's a warrant for your arrest, right? Yeah, but that cop was one of them. So he, nobody called my parents. Oh. Yeah. Mm. So, um, so uh, there's a place called Day One, mm. and it's a it's a one year program for kids, and a part of their program is for 90 days. Um, there's no outside contact. They want to like reboot you, so there's um, no phone calls, no letters, nothing for 90 days, and you have to agree mm. to this. You can't even like walk with somebody to the post to the you know to get the mail. You're you're in, and it's a year long program. And the kids have to vote whether or not I accept you. So I did the interview with the staff and the interview with the kids, and the kids said um, we're worried that you're going to be sexual with us. Hmm. And I said, well, that's a valid you know thing to be afraid of. Tell you what, you don't try to have sex with me. I won't try to have sex with you. We'll get along fine. So they agreed, mm -hmm. and I'm supposed to go to day one the next day. And uh, that night, it's after hours. The staff at Crossroads has gone home, and um, the ladies and I are watching something on television. The night nurses is, is there, as always. And the phone rings, and they say, Kathy, it's for you. And it was my dad. And he said, I love you, I need you, come home. Well, that, you know, my dad has said that before. You know, my dad loves me. I just didn't want him to love me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that wasn't, it wasn't shocking that he did that, but my biological reaction was very unusual. I felt a, um, a panic go through me like, you have to get to your dad. Emergency, emergency, emergency. And I'm like, I don't know what is going on, but I got to go to Florida, you know? And um, so I went to the night nurse and I said, I can't explain this, but I, I need to get to my dad. And she said, I need to call staff. So she called staff and staff said, she's not 18. Um, we're really not supposed to have her. So don't help her but don't stop her mm. just let her do on her own and so um, i called some um, aa people and they gave me a ride to the bus stop which was terrifying because that's where pimps hang out to pick up girls okay so am i going to run into my pimp i was freaked out get in the bus take the bus to winthrop massachusetts my grandmother picks me up there. I spend the night at her place. Next day, I hop on an airplane. I go to Florida, mm -hmm. um, West Palm Beach, Florida. My dad picks me up, spend the night, wake up the next morning. Dad's getting ready for um, work, making his breakfast. He reaches over to get toast or whatever it was. And on his forearm, there was like a half of a hard boiled egg bulging underneath his skin. And I'm like, what is this? 
And he said, it's cancer. And I said, have you seen a doctor? Have you talked to anybody? He said, no, I know what it is. And then he went to work. And I went to his Rolodex, his address book, and I called some names that I recognized and said, something's wrong with my dad. He's sick. And then when dad came home, you know, they called mm. and he said, oh, I'm fine. You know, I'm fine. And it was around the time. Why would he say cancer then if he hadn't checked it out? He knew. Oh. So um, me leaving um, Crossroads happened to be around that same uh, early spring when we would leave a month before school left and got let out mm. to go to Maine. Mm. So we got my brother and sister and um, myself, and I had a little dog, um, uh, two, little rescue dog. And we hop in the station wagon and we start to drive to Maine and my dad um, pulls over at the Dog Humane Society and he said, my dog's name is Lady, leave Lady here. Who does that? Just what? You know, what? I had had so much loss. I had had so much abuse. I had so much, this is my little dog. And my dad is saying, leave your dog at a dog shelter. I cried all the way to Maine. I, that was just, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't believe that he did that. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, can't wait to get away from you again. Um, but I'm confused, um, you know, cancer. And so I cried all the way to Maine. Uh, hindsight, he knew he was going to die. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we get to Maine, the three-day trip, and when we get there and his friends see what he looks like, mm. they said, go to the doctor. And he went to the doctor, and I was cleaning one of the cottages. My sister, um, from 10 to 24, went to a Christian girls' camp in mm. New Hampshire. So she was at girls' camp. My brother and I were doing our work at the campground. Um, I was in one of the cottages cleaning it. And dad came in and he said, I've been to the doctor and they say I have a malignant melanoma and they want me to pack a bag and come back. He said, um, I have cancer from the top of my head to my toes. And they said, I have two months or two years to live. How did life turn at that point for you? It was uh, a, looking back one of the pivotal times in my life, one of the real turning points in my lifetime so far. Um, my mother was, you know, my parents were divorced. My mom was living in Kansas. My brother was hanging out with his friends, working uh, on the campground, but really spending a lot of time with his friend, Tim. And uh, my sister was at a Christian girls camp in Fitzwilliamsburg, New Hampshire. And I advocated for my mother to come up and say goodbye to my dad and for my sister to be brought up. And there was a lot of um, pushback on, on that. Um, so I had to sort of, um, I was a, at that time, I was such a meek, uh, broken, uh, I played really small because that's how I survived everything was to stay small. So there was no boldness. Mm -hmm. um, I was very constricted, not expanded. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, challenging for me to, to say uh, my dad's only sibling, his brother had come up, his mother, my beloved grandmother was up. And for me to say, please let my sister come and say goodbye. No, we don't want her to see her father this way. She deserves to say goodbye, you know, back and forth. I won that case. My sister was brought up and um, my, called my mom and my mom had her own issues going on at the time and with a, um, a, a mentally struggling, depressed uh, husband. And I said, please come up. And she said, I'm not going to come up unless he's for sure dying. And I'm like, kind of, you know, as a, as a 17 year old, I was just like trying to get my head wrapped. Why wouldn't you just come right up? Um, so she did uh, come up. My father was failing really quickly. Um, my 
uh, uncle was concerned about the legalities, the trust, that sort of thing. I remember as dad started to decline and he was nearing the dying point, he had a few days left. The nurses were saying he's going to die at any, at any time. Um, one of the doctors, n not much was known about malignant melanoma at the time. So there wasn't anything in the library or, or anything on it, but one of the doctors suggested a book and I got the book to read it, understand what was happening and how this particular cancer kills. And in the back of the book, it had a do not resuscitate, um, uh, a DNR, which was very uncommon. It was not common practice in 1981 um, uh, to have people sign this. So it was a new thing. And I remember while my dad was conscious, bringing, you know, I tore it out of the back of the book and it was um, very emotional for me as a 17 year old girl to go into my dad's hospital bed a room and say, do you want to be resuscitated when you start to die? And to have him sign it and then me give that to the doctor. That was really um, a difficult thing to do. So dad's um, progressing, he's got a few more days of life, he's in and out of coma, and we were doing round the clock visiting him. And after three days, uh, we were exhausted, just exhausted. So one evening on um, August 8th, I don't, you know, around bedtime, I went home, um, to the uh, office where, where we lived and my little sister Tracy went um, to stay at my Uncle Ray's house. I didn't know that she was going to Uncle Ray's house and spend the night with Sherry, her cousin, and my brother was off um, partying. He was doing a lot of acid that summer. Um, he was off partying with his friend Tim and I went to the home office there was nobody in our in our home but me. Uh, Mom was at the hospital. Um, Ray's wife um, was at the hospital, and um, uh, I went to sleep. And I, w as I mentioned, we weren't a religious family, so this was uh, a a sort of rare thing. I had had interesting spiritual moments, like the revival. Um, like um, when my dad, uh, or when I escaped, you know, having that conversation with God. You know, different times I had spiritual things, moments happen, but this dream was the first of its kind. Mm -hmm. So I had this dream that, um, and I don't know how to, exp I don't really know how to explain it other than I wasn't seeing a movie, but it was like an impression on my mind that was saying, you need to get to the hospital now. Um, you're, they're not going to let you in to the room. They're not gonna easily let you into the hospital room. You need to be bold and fight to get in the hospital room. It's imperative that you get into the hospital room. So I, I woke up thinking, what kind of dream, you know, what is happening? Just like when my dad called and said, I love you, I need you to come home, and I had that emergency feeling, I woke up with that emergency feeling, like, get to the hospital. And the hospital was about, you know, 15 minutes away from where we lived, and where we lived on the campground, there was no public road. Mm. So there wasn't, like, traffic or anything. Um, most people at night, you know, there's nobody driving around, everybody's at their cottage. So um, I was wondering, how, how am I going to get to the hospital? I don't have a car. I don't, you know. Um, so I wake up with this urgent feeling, wondering how am I going to get there? And when I walk out of my bedroom, I see that there's a light on um, in the other part of the house. And I thought, that's odd. I didn't turn any lights on. Why is there a light on? Who's in my house? Mm -hmm. So I walk through the kitchen and around to the um, living room and my Uncle Ray, one of my um, offenders, my mother's brother, um, was sitting there with a jug at his feet, 
um, either it was a see-through alcohol, so gin or vodka, with this much left on the bottom of it. And I walked around and he looked up at me and he said, Kathy, I know that your dad is your father, but he's also like family to me and I'm losing someone too. And as family, we really need to stick together and comfort each other during this time. So that might sound um, one way to a non-victim, mm -hmm. but to me, I knew what he was saying. I needed to comfort him, sexually comfort him. So I said, uh, I can't, I'm gay which worked for my dad that time in the mm. kitchen. So I'm hoping that that will work for him. And he stands up out of the recliner and he takes my wrist and he said, then you will like this. And he pulled me uh, through the door right behind him, which was my dad's bedroom. So he pulls me into the bedroom, uh, lays me back on the bed with my feet on the floor. And um, I can see my dad's night table and I can see the Polaroid pictures of my mom next to his bedside. And that uh, touched me and validated for me, confirmed that my dad to his death still loves and is in love with my mother. So I'm laying there and, I, and again, as I mentioned before, um, for a, a victim, somebody who's being sexually assaulted, you try to get out of it um, if you can't get out of it, then you try not to be hurt mm -hmm. as much as possible. And then you try to get it over with as quickly as possible. And as a, a, a victim, and this might not, probably won't make sense to people who haven't been uh, molested as, as a child, but my mind knew that in order for this to end, uh, he needed to have an orgasm, and orgasm equals freedom. So uh, he is not going to have an orgasm this way. The whole gay thing was to get him to not want to have sex with me at all. So now I need to like get this going. So I need to pretend that I am so into him, that I'm so sexually turned on, that I want him to have sex, you know, I want him to have intercourse with me. So I'm like, fuck me you know, fuck me now, whatever, something. Um, and he laughed in my face and that smell of alcohol was just kind of makes me still a little bit nauseous. Fuck, you know, he laughs at me and, um, and said, I knew you weren't gay. Um, um, has intercourse with me, ejaculates quickly thank God, because sometimes if they're intoxicated, mm. it lasts longer. But, and then he sort of rolled off of me. I stand up, his semen runs down my legs. I'm pulling up my pants, trying to get out the door and go outside, pulling up my pants, going out the front door. And there just happens to be a car in front of the house just total God job. Um, I don't even remember who they were, but there were kids that I recognized, teenagers, and I said, can I please have a ride to the hospital? And this is late. This is, you know, maybe nine, 10 o'clock at night um, timing. And they said, of course, I got in the car. They took me to the hospital. And when I went to his floor, I, th I I think it was room 291, but I went to his floor, went to his room, sure enough, the door was shut. And um, I n knocked on the door and tried to open it, and my mother stood in the crack of the door and said, go home, this isn't good, you need to get out of here. And through the crack over my mom's shoulder, I could see my dad pulling his arms and he was trying to pull the skin. He was trying to pull his body off of his soul to get out. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, quoting Cain and Abel um, scripture. Was and he delirious or was he conscious at that time or? He, I don't know. I was mm -hmm. seeing through the crack what he was doing. 
and I knew he was in and out of a coma, okay. so I don't know what his level of consciousness mm. was. And um, my aunt came over to the door. Mom opened it enough that Uncle Ray, the guy that just had sex with me, uh, my aunt is there, and she came out, took my wrist, seemed to be a thing, and she tries to pull me down the hallway, and I broke free, came back to the door, and I have to be bold. And this was so out of character for me. And I said, you know, Mom, you know, you left Dad. I stayed with him. I have technically been with Dad longer than you have. I deserve to be in here. Let me in. And so I was sort of making a scene. And Mom was really conscious of how people saw things. Mm. She let me in. Mm. So my my uncle and grandmother were gone, and it was just my mother and um, my aunt, Ray's wife. Mm -hmm. And um, Ray's wife was in a chair next to the door against the wall, and my mother was um, on the left side of the, of the bed, and there was a chair on the right side. And um, Dad's bed was flat, and he sounded like he was drowning. And I walk into this sound, and I'm like, what's happening? And my mom said, oh, the nurse said, this is normal. It's just a part of the drying, dying process. And I said, no, it's not. And I pressed the elevation button, and Dad's bed went Yeah, the fluids. The fluid went down. He calmed down. I don't, like, he wasn't talking, so he... I think he was in a coma, you know, he was in and out, and he, he calmed down, and when he calmed down, I sat down, so it was his uh, left hand, and I sat facing him, and they had removed the, the bed of, um, you know, they had, there was two beds to a room, they had removed the bed, you know, so that this was empty space, and um, I took my dad's hand and I put it on my cheek and I could feel the urine bag against mm -hmm. warm against my leg. And I was just praying that God would let him die peacefully. So I put my cheek on his hand and I just fell asleep praying, please let him go, let him go peacefully, let his suffering end. And then I was out cold. I was sound asleep, my face, my cheek on his hand, his swollen hand. And uh, another, you know, God moment, it was, um, this is going to sound crazy, but it's my reality. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody would have come up behind me and grabbed my shoulders and shook me violently, that was to the extent that I was uh, awakened. It was a, a sh I was sound asleep, and it was a shocking um, uh, awakening. And when I woke up, like, what's happening? You know, who who woke me up? What's happening? Uh, feeling, and I noticed, I felt uh, like something was in the corner of the room. And I did not, again, grow up in church. We weren't, you know, really, I didn't know about angels or whatever, you know. But I felt, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was somebody in the room with us. Mm. And I looked over at my dad and I watched him breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. No more breathing, no more breathing, no more breathing. And then I felt him leave his body and go over to the corner of the, the other side of the room. I know that this is happening. I feel like this is happening, but I have no... Um, reality check for it. I've never heard of anything like this. I've never seen anything like this on movies. 
I have nothing to compare it to. It is a unique, undeniable experience. No breathing. So I, I, I feel them and I, and I don't know if it's Jesus, like I don't know who the other person is with my dad, but I, I say thank you in my mind. I say thank you, thank you for ending his suffering. And I say to my dad, I'm sorry I was such a bad kid. And I felt my dad say that he was sorry and that he loved me. And then they were gone. Not that I saw them, but they were gone. And then I look over at my dad, no breathing. And I'm thinking, is this the fucking twilight zone? Like, what is happening right now? And I, I knew he was gone, and they were gone. And I went to speak. And I, I felt like time had stood still. Like my mom and my aunt, nobody said anything nobody they didn't move like mom was sort of staring out into space and i don't know what she was doing she was behind me but this all this is happening and they're not moving or saying anything and i made up that time at frozen and when i went to speak i went to say the word mom when the sound of m m started to come out I felt like time started again. And as soon as I said, Mom, um, Mom, he's gone. Um, Then the energy changed and my mom looked over at me and she looked at him and I stood up and I walked out into the hallway. And this is, you know, after midnight, this is 1.30 in the morning or something. And I started to walk down the hall and the two sides of the of the rooms, you know, the hallway, the two walls, are like uh, black in my my peripheral vision. And the closer I got to the end of the hall where the nurses' station was, was just like black, 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 black. And just before everything was black and I collapsed, my hands slammed down on the nurse's station. And the, the nurses, um, they go by visual and I had a tattoo, a tattoo, I had bleach blonde hair that had grown out. I looked like something the cat threw up. <coughs> Um, the nurses treated me like I looked. Um, in today's world, I would look like somebody on meth, you know. Um, I looked unhealthy. I was unhealthy. So when this nurse saw me and I collapsed with a slam, a slap of my hands, she said, can I help you? It wasn't a, oh, my dear, are you okay? What's going on? How can I? It was, can I help you? And that was the energy that I had been getting from them the whole time. I said, um, my father is dead. In a way, like, give me a fucking break. You know, my father is dead. And she said, I'll let your nurse know. And this time now my aunt and my mother was there. And there was a waiting room type thing just to the left. And we walked in with the nurse, the nurse confirmed that dad was dead, came into the waiting room with my aunt and my mother and myself. And um, sometimes when children swim in really cold water, they shake like this, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I was shaking like that. I, um, a wash of this trembling was happening to my whole body. I was and my mom must have looked at the nurse like, what's going on with her? And the, uh, the nurse said, she's in shock. 
when really that was my first of 20,000 uh, panic attacks that would happen from that point on. Mm. So we went home and remember I was the kind of girl that boys wanted to have sex with when nobody was looking but nobody wanted to be my boyfriend in the light of day. So we go home. I do not want to go back into my house. Um, and uh, I went up to another cottage where a boy I knew was sleeping. And I got into the cot next to him. And he said, are you OK? I said, Dad just died. And he said, will you marry me? Not because we were boyfriend and girlfriend, but now I'm a dollar. Now I'm uh. money. I'll inherit the property. And I went to sleep, kept waking up. Throughout the night, um, I would felt like I would stop breathing and I would wake up. A side note um, to this event that I'm um, I'm really happy about is that while so my uncle had an orgasm, mm -hmm. so when I left, my uncle staggered down to his house, his cottage where my sister and his daughter were. Well, while he was waiting for me or whatever he's doing in my house, my cousin is showing my sister her diary. And that diary went into great detail of how her father was sexually abusing her, how he would go to the toilet and show her her own bowel movement and hold his penis and said, if this can come out of you, this can go in you. She kept all this documentation of how he had sex with her, the things he would say, everything. So my sister had this journal and he comes down into the house and he makes, my brother and sister weren't never sexually abused. Um, they had escaped that amazingly. And my, he made a play for my sister but because he just had an orgasm, when she ran out of the house, he did not chase her. So she escaped what would have been her first child molestation on the night that her father died. Uh. So, be, so it's like, um, of all the times I have ever been raped, whatever awful things have ever happened to me, that was the one that was worth it. That was so worth it. Mm. And the next day, she gave that journal to a friend of the family who called the police. And my uncle went to prison for seven years at the Thomaston State Prison, where my pimp escaped from. And his wife uh, was sentenced to a year for a, in the women's prison for allowing what had happened. Mm. None of us were brought in. He wasn't. Um, he wasn't convicted of anything other than the horrific things he had done to his own one daughter, never mind his other kids, never mind all of us. But he did. Um, and how old were those? Were your cousin, was your sister or your cousin at that time? When my sister was 10. Okay. And my cousin was probably the same age. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So she went, um, Sherry went into foster care and um, her parents went went to prison okay interesting um thank you for sharing that story that's a powerful story to wrap that story up just to recap um going back because there was a, a missing link there that we didn't go into is that um your uncle ray was molesting you at what age did he start that molestation from from and did your parents know or did your mom know or, and did you uh, did you know whether they were aware my, um, it was interesting that you would ask that because, um, you know, my, my dad was sharing, um, pornographic stories with me that, uh, uh, alluding to, not alluding, it was clear, it's okay to have sex with your daughter. So he's sharing these stories with me. He's asked me, um, to be sexual with him. But I had never put my uncle, uh, an extraordinary, um, remarkable 
um, predator with my dad. You know, I, I never had put them in the same box um, until I'm 58 years old now, until a couple of years ago. A uh, couple of years ago, remember I, I said that um, I had a bed up in the attic and I came, you know, I pulled the thing and the stairs come down out of the ceiling and my dad was there alone and asked me to be sexual with him. And his words were, I hear you give good blowjobs. Mm -hmm. I didn't really think much about that. I mean, I was trying to get out of a pending sexual assault. So my mind was, I'm gay, I'm running out, what do I, you know, I'm trying to yeah, get away. Yeah, you're not analytical. I'm not analytical no. at the time. No. So a, a couple of years ago, I'm in the grocery store, and I don't even know wh why, I, you know, like I don't get it, but I'm in the grocery store, and I had this thought that, um, that just came out of seemingly nowhere that said, your uncle told your dad that you gave good blowjobs. And I just froze because it felt like absolute truth. Like I didn't even know that was a haunting thing in my brain. It wasn't like I thought about, you know, I'm in my 50s, I'm not, you know, I'm not thinking about this at all. And it just came to me out of nowhere. And it was like, yes, it just was like, like the like the time when the um, the offender said, "Hey, it's old times. Let's do it." And I'm like, "I I was a victim. I'm not a whore." That aha moment. So I'm in the grocery stores. The pieces came together, and I went, "Wow, my uncle was trying to justify his own behavior by getting somebody so well respected and admired as my dad to join the party, right?" Um, I'm like, "Wow." And so um, by that time in my life, I've done a, just a tremendous amount of self-help and self-growth work that I was able to recognize the impact biologically and psycholo psychologically of this download or whatever the trendy things mm -hmm. thought that came. And I, um, I'm like, okay, Kathy, my inner child, um, what do you need? Can you, can you get through the checkout counter and get to the car? Or do you need to leave your grocery cart and get the hell out of this building right this minute? When do you need to feel these feelings? Are you okay? And, I, and I'm like, okay, I think I'm okay. I can, I'll get through the checkout. I'll get to the car. Can I have a breakdown where the car is parked? <laughs> You know, mm. you know, can I make it home and just uh, trying to take care of myself and what I what I need because I recognize what a big, you know, moment that was to realize that. So a it gaping took my uncle, hole, a gaping yeah, hole that was filled. Yeah, that was filled. Yeah. Um, and that's a gaping hole. I think the gaping hole, the only gaping hole that um, we need to clarify is at what age did your uncle start abusing you? And was that continuous through your entire up to the age of when your dad died yeah my know? uncle didn't um my dad did not give my uncle um the job of living at the campground year round so um in exchange for keeping an eye on the campground during the winter and keeping it safe he could live rent free and have to pay his own utilities and mm. stuff so I don't know what age I was when he moved in and that was happening. Um, it's all sort of a blur. I know that I was, um, I don't know, 14, 13, I don't know, some age like that. Okay. And it was summers. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And he had uh, initially when he first moved there, he had Sherry with his current wife at the time and at least two children. I feel like there might have been three, but maybe I'm thinking of Sherry. So at least two children of his own from his previous marriage. So he had plenty of children to have sex with. Mm -hmm. So the two children were gone 
and it was just Sherry when he was being sexual with me. Mm. But I don't know how many countless other children in our area he was being sexual with as well. Great. Okay, that closes that that loop then, and that can be filled up. And um, the last thing I need to know before we close off that period is, was your mom aware that her brother was doing that? And was she aware that you were going through that with your own family? Never mind all the outside things that were going on, right? So mom's contention was that her childhood was far worse than mine. So she made up that no matter what bad thing I was experiencing, it still wasn't nearly as bad as hers. Her and Uncle Ray were the eldest two children in their family and um, very dysfunctional alcoholism, sexual abuse, extreme po poverty. They were in Virginia and, and uh, the child welfare took the two older kids out of the home and put them in separate foster care so that the younger kids could stay with mom. Like each kid had a different dad and it was, you know, sort of a Jerry Springer situation. Mm -hmm. And my dad with that um, uh, wanting to be the savior complex, you know, saved her from um, her life. So um, Ray and my mom were sexually abused in the foster care that they were in. Ray was beaten and sexually abused. And then he went to the Vietnam War, um, had that experience. So he, he was a really uh, messed up individual, mm. you know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I, and I did, like, I don't remember if I told her about Uncle Ray. <coughs> um, I did tell my dad, I just had this memory. I did tell mm. my dad about Uncle Ray, and I told him, um, I, I think it was the summer that he was diagnosed and he was home from the hospital for, uh, for a, a period of time, maybe to gather, I don't know, but he was home. And I remember him sitting on a picnic table, and I said, I wanna talk to you. And I said, Uncle Ray is um, having sex with me. And um, I'm just remembering this. And he said, um, do this. Next time Ray tries to have sex with you, tell him what would, what would Burke think about this? And he won't do it. And I thought, really? Do you think he doesn't know whose child I am? Really? This was a waste of time. You know, um, yeah. Okay. And my, my mom, before my parents got divorced, uh, one of my rapes, I did tell mom early on. With Ray? With, with somebody oh, else. With somebody else. Okay. Um, and I, mom was doing laundry. She was like taking clothes out of the dryer or something. And I said, mom, I was raped. And she stopped for a moment and looked up at me. And she said, well, that's what you get for wearing t-shirts without a bra. Okay. And how old were you when you uh, I, Well, they were still married, so I was under 13. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't, you know, I, I learned early on that me saying something just got me deeper, you know, um, it just hurt me more. Yeah. If I told the family I was staying with, well, then I wouldn't have that place to stay. Mm -hmm. So, and it wouldn't be an emergency place to stay. So maybe it's a bad place to stay mm -hmm. and something bad's happening to me there. So I'm gonna leave there. I'm gonna go to another place to stay. But if that place is worse than this place, then if I don't wanna burn that bridge in case I need to go back, even though something bad will happen, maybe it won't be as bad as what's happening there. Mm -hmm. So it's always, you know, figuring out, juggling, you know, juggling. Yeah. Got it. Perfect. Uh, that closes off that series. Thank you so much. Now your dad is gone. And what is, what, what happens next in that period of your life? Mm. What do you do? Mm. So I'm 17 and now, um, 
this is such a, an interesting wild ride of a journey because I have essentially been um, programmed to be like a sexual con concubine. So I am a good Dear Abby and I'm good sexually and that is the only worth or value that I have. Don't know how to have friends or normal interactions. I'm street smart. I know how to survive in a subculture. Um, and this is where I start my next journey in Overland Park, Kansas, Bible Belt, USA. <laughs> She said, listen, Kathy, I don't care where you go, what you do, whatever you want to do is fine. I ask one thing, will you please get on the plane and just let everybody see you get on the plane as a family. And then when we land, do whatever you want. And I got to be in that, in nature, in the country with my baby. And then I had another baby and then I had cancer. And so no more babies. I studied every day. I did my therapy, you know, twice a week. I did my 12 step group therapy every weekday. I went to church two or three times a week. That was a beautiful healing time for me. And this whole period was um, really trying to learn how to be a human being. But I fought him and all those years on the street, I never physically fought back. I tried to protect myself, tried to survive the situation, but I never, ever fought back because they would kill me. Mm. So this was my first time, oh no, you are not going to hit me, you know, and I bit and I punched and I, I mean, he won, but I fought back and I didn't die.